Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I will give you a little bit of a introduction to the things that we're going to be covering today. And um, before I, I do that, I'll, I'll go ahead and open us up in prayer as we typically do. So dear Heaven, Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you would be working in the lives of each of the students in this course. I pray that the material will be clear, that they can be getting a better sense of what it means to be a systems engineer. And so they can get familiar with that part of engineering. And I pray also that you would help them in their time at APU, that they can really enjoy and, and get to see the, the many nuggets of valuable information we have in scripture and how we want to be guided in our lives with the theological concepts that we derive from that and give them interesting and creative ways for faith integration. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. Okay, so what we're going to do today is we're going to be finishing up the last of the four chapters that are found in the foundations part of our course. And um, with the material we've covered so far, I think it'll be helpful as we start to get into the next three areas where we get into a lot more detail um, when we got a, an introduction to the system development process that we mentioned last time. And then after that, I'm going to pull up my um, visual paradigms and also the other tool that I'm using to try and help us get a better sense of how we're going to do our, our diagrams. And I last time I talked about um, the, the use case diagrams, and so I'm going to have a little bit more conversation about that. And I invite everybody to have their their tool open. And if you haven't already started to flesh out your diagrams, um, we can do that real time. I thought all of the proposals that people submitted were interesting and, and creative. And so I think that'll give us a nice rich canvas for, for us to be building upon. So let's go ahead and we'll go through this chapter. Um, relatively speaking, it's a, it's a little bit shorter. And so maybe that'll be good for the material that we're gonna be trying to cover in our course. And so we're taking a course in system engineering, but a related element is um, management. And hopefully as a result of the material that we cover, you'll be uh, cover here, you'll get a, a better sense of that. And so um, there's a whole process of managing system development and risks. So those are two parts, the development, how we go about doing it. Um, it's not just having a concept in your, uh, in, your, in your head, but it has to be realized in a way that you can actually make that happen. And also you want to be managing risk. So system engineering is a part of a project management that provides technical guidelines, system integration and technical coordination. And so there's these players in that in that cadre, the program manager, the project manager, and so you can have one or more project manager managers that are supporting the project um, program, and then you can have system engineering. They all play a role in the planning, budgeting, and execution of the the system. And so this diagram from our um, textbook might help to give you a distinction that we have this whole orb of project management. And then we have in this Venn diagram, two parts. We have the system engineering, we have this circle, and then the project planning and control. So we can see that say about half of the project planning and control overlaps with what system engineering is doing. And each time that we touch on these topics, hopefully you're getting to have a better sense of what's what we're doing. So for system engineering, there's a system architecture. We have to be doing concept design. And then after you have the concept design, you want to start to put that into functional groups that, that make sense. We'll begin to get some insight in that as we're looking at use case diagrams. There's a technical coordination. Um, and this gets into the technical disciplines um, for a complex system. There's all kinds of technical disciplines that need to be um, played out and worked out. And with large systems, you're likely going to have to have subcontractors. And so this would be something the system engineering is going to have to talk with the, the technical teams and the subcontractors. There's a system integration dealing with the interface management and the verification and valid validation. Um, and so the architecture, 
coordination and integration. There's also task definition where you need to be figuring out the, the task allocation, the, the program reviews, um, what things are gonna be monitored. Um, there's a risk management. We'll be talking about this more risk assessment and then coming up with the ones that are really severe, especially coming up with a risk management plan for those. Plus there's also the customer interaction where we're dealing with um, management and also um, technical concerns. And then outside of this, we have the project um, pl planning, the, the work breakdown, the cost and schedules, and we'll see a high level um, illustration of those. So the resource allocation, how we're gonna be allocating manpower and facilities to make things work. And finally, the, the financial and contract management, this is where there's a program commitment with the customer and also with the, the subcontractors. So some of this may not make too much sense, but um, based on some of the things that you guys have shared with your projects, um, I think you're you're getting a chance to, you're gonna get exposed to that. So Nathan, dealing with um, designing and assessing um, missile silos, um, Abby trying to look at competition for Elon Musk and Tesla for um, uh, electric cars. And um, Jonathan looking at uh, nuclear power plants. So those are all things that are gonna be quite comprehensive. And, uh, and also Kyle is looking at uh, CubeSat arena. And so you're gonna see that to make those real, you're gonna have to deal with a lot of different disciplines. So the first thing, let's think about this work breakdown structure. And this is a term that's quite useful um, in the, the project planning control. And so we have this work breakdown, but there's gonna be elements here that will be some interactions with what would be going on for a system engineer. The system engineering role also involves contributing to resource allocation, tax, task definition and customer interaction with the initial focus on the development of the work breakdown structure. What actually needs to be done to, to make this enterprise um, system or the system of system or this just large complex system? It's a hierarchical task organization that divides total efforts into sub, um, successively smaller work elements. And this provides a basis for scheduling, cost and monitoring enables cost control and estimation. So one key tool used for program scheduling is a critical path method. And so I know with your proposal, at least you were exposed to some of these names to a high level. Um, wasn't asking you to create a, a WBS or to be doing a critical path analysis of your, your schedule, but this is stuff that is um, there. So the, the critical path method is based on the, the WBS work elements and creates a network of sequential activities. Analyzing this network enables the system engineering and program management to identify paths that take the longest to complete. And so that if you're bound to a schedule, you have to be looking at the thing that takes the longest. And that's what you have to, to ensure that you have enough pad to ensure you're gonna be able to do that. So this uh, gives you an idea of the, the levels that can be found in a WBS. And so you can have level one be dealing with the system. Um, level two can be dealing with a system product, um, maybe at a slightly lower level. And then you get into the subsystem, the component, and then the specifying more details about each of those components. And so this just gives you an idea. So um, you have like one digit, two digit, three digit, four digit, and five digits. That just gives you an idea of the, the levels in a WBS. And here just gives you some um, insight into what would be in some of the sections for a WBS. Um, so you can have the, the, the system product that would be the top level and then the, um, I think there might be a typo here. This is the, the system support. And then we start to be figuring that out in different ways of um, at the, the next level. So we're at the, the three level in the WBS. 
um, what type of um, equipment, facilities, personnel, that would be in the system support. Then we have the system testing, the integration testing, the system testing, the accepted testing, and the operational testing and evaluation. All of those are things that are going to be covered. Then there's the project management. And so that needs to be having a separate line item um, and system engineering. There's a term called CFM system. That's where I guess the S, E, um, and then um, management program. So set, um, um, I mean, program management. So SCPM tries to, to book how much this is going to be the total cost of the program maybe on the order of about 10 per percent. So we're not gonna be getting into this. This isn't an MBA type of program or where we're starting to um, get proficient in being cost analysts, but you're getting exposed to some of these details. There are some contractual documents that are out there. First of all, there is the system engineering plan and there's also the system engineering management plan. So the system engineering plan often is, is associated with the U.S. government contracts, it addresses the program's requirements, overall technical approach, and, and metrics for the program. So that's the first one. And then the other one is the system engineering management plan. And so this catalogs the implementation of all system engineering tasks. In the process, it defines the roles and responsibility of all the participants. So all of these contractual documents are things that really help to have a complex system come together in a, an appropriate way. So this just gives you an idea of where the place of the SEMP is in the overall program management plans. And so it's right here in the middle. And so you can top start with the, the program requirements. The, the requirements are incredibly important because this is what you're defining exactly what you're you're going to be doing. And so we'll be getting a chance to be looking at that from a, a model-based system engineering point of view. In our next um, part, we're gonna be starting with our, our, our user stories, our, our, our user scenarios first, the use case diagrams. But then below the requirements, we have the program management plan we then have the, the system engineering plan that feeds into that. There's a program technical requirements, different kinds of specifications. And so you have the, the technical baseline clearly laid out. You have other program management requirements and um, configuration management, test, manufacturing, quality, all of those has to be laid out. And things that fall out from the, the SAMP are individual program plans, for functional design, reliability, all, all of these abilities, reliability, maintainability, producibility, safety, and logistics. All of those are things that have to be captured that are part of the, the management part where system engineering contributes. <clears throat> so the organization of system engineering, the, the system engineering organization spans the discipline of participating organiza organizations, but also adapts to the company organizational structure. So those are important. So therefore system engineering must communicate effectively what, when, and why to the proper stakeholders. So there's an interface directly with the, the, the customer um, and provide technical reviews for all of the participants. In large program system engineering is supported by a system um, analysis staff. And so you can have a, a system engineering manager and below them, they can have a, a variety of individuals that are supporting that. Large programs will require formal system design teams, which integrate major subsystems and subcontractors in the product of software systems engineering. These teams contain members from support engineering and the test organization and typically contain specialty um, say concurrent engineering members as appropriate. They, they may also include user representation when appropriate. So a customer may, um, if they're gonna be in any, um, shadowing any part of the developments, it's gonna start out with the system engineering and management parts, but they also may have a, a, an in-depth technical role going down one or two layers below that. A key 
role for system engineering involvement in these design teams is to keep their focus on the success of the entire enterprise. So someone may have an incredible interest, maybe a customer or one of their um, lieutenants that is uh, supporting the, the customer team. You wanna make sure that they're seeing the, the bigger picture not focusing on one um, individual piece of hardware or part of the development. So an important part of system engineering is you have to be dealing with the management of the system development and risk. And so those are two different but related areas. System engineering is a, a large part of what's going on here. We had a Venn diagram that tried to give an idea of what that looked like. We at least introduced the term, the, the WBS or work break, breakdown structure. Um, and so this is something that is um, very detailed and the whole program control side that has to be done. And this is um, re reported incrementally to the customer. We talked about these two plans, a system engineering plan. So that would be one plan. And there's also the system engineering management plan. Those are typically contractual documents for large um, um, enterprise class type of systems. And finally, we got a chance to talk a little bit about the organization of system engineering. Any comments or questions on that? Okay, well, if we had to do a mini course on system engineering, this would be a place where we would start and say in four lectures, we could be capturing that. Um, let me just do the, the typical thumbs up, everybody following what I said, any, that's may, maybe a way for me to get some, some feedback that you guys are all, okay, good, good, just wanted to, to verify that. Okay, um, I'm going to change the, the screen that I'm going to be sharing, so let me um, go over to Visual Paradigms, we'll start with that. And um, this would be a good time if you don't have it already up and running that you go ahead and do that. And I'll start with this picture here. Um, and I'll show you how I, I, I got here. Oh, wrong screen again, so let me try that again. Okay, so this is the visual paradigms. This is one of the views that you can have that will show you all of the different diagrams that you've created and it specifies them by type of diagram. And so we're talking about um, use case diagrams. And so I'm gonna go to this one. And so this little thing over here, if I click on that, it takes me to that view that I just had there. There's some other things here you can get some insight into the model structure. And this is something that ha I had to do manually to, to get a chance to, to have this, this, these folder structures, but we'll, we're not gonna focus on that, but just going back to this, um, this here. And so um, let me go to the, what I showed um, the very beginning last Tuesday. And so um, with your proposal, the, the, the more details you supply, the, the better. And so what I'm trying to, to have is in um, a CubeSat um, SysML modeling. And so what I'm going to be looking at is both a communication payload and a, um, an imaging payload that has the ability to do some remote sensing, um, all constrained within the resources that are available for a CubeSat. And I know Kyle, he is going to be focusing on CubeSats. He expressed interest in trying to be focusing on the power um, subsystem, but we really need to get a, a large enough context to, to do all of the work we wanna be doing in our, um, our project work. And so, what I'm going to do is, well, that's fine, but let's give a larger context to, to be thinking about that. And so um, let me see, just um, thumbs up or thumbs down have, or just go off mute, whatever you'd like to do. Have you guys actually started to put together any use case diagrams for, 
your project? Uh, I have not yet. Okay. Um, well, just make sure you have your visual paradigms open like what I have here. Anybody else? Thumbs up, thumbs down, or any other? You can also do in the chat or just go off mute. I have a diagram. Okay. So um, then let's do this way. Has everybody? Does everybody have visual paradigms open? Okay, Jonathan, good. Abby, good. Nathaniel and Kyle, do you have um, visual paradigms open? Yeah, it's open. Okay, good. So well, let's look at what we what we've got here. And so here are some players. And so what I'd recommend is that you have as a minimum um, three use case diagrams. And I have um, a couple here that I'll show you. And I'll just continue the introduction. And then I'll um, let's see if we can start to to flesh that out for the specifics of your system. And so um, there's a couple different kind of conventions that I'm showing here. First of all, we have a stakeholder. And so if I want to have someone called a stakeholder, first of all, we can create an actor. And then I can um, let me try it a different way. So So once I create an actor, if I right click on this and I can go under stereotypes and so like this very top one, I can make it a stakeholder. And so what it does, it annotates it as a stakeholder there. And so it gives a special significance to that actor. And so that might be an annotation that you might want to use. I also colorize it to try and have a, an indication of the different roles. And so this is a customer. And so I gave them green. And so these other three um, actors are actually part of um, the APU team. One would be a mission manager. And if I had everybody doing, um, working on a the, the APU ECS um, CubeSat project, um, we didn't really exercise this in the last year, but we did have a chief engineer, a, a mission manager that was directing the, the system engineering development. And so everything um, is supposed to be routed through the mission manager. And so this mission manager works with the, um, the CubeSat controller and below that, the way I've annotated it is this another individual, the payload controller actually reports to the CubeSat controller. I Just to give you an idea, sometimes a customer might want to have um, reach maybe a layer below this mission management um, and it might be more of a dotted line relationship. And so these just are, um, just a, a standard relationship, but this is a, um, say, um, well, this is the way it's fleshed, it explained as a, as a dependency. And so um, maybe not as a direct kind of a relationship be, between those elements. I also have a couple other dependency types of relationships here. So I was just playing with this before class to, to give some perspective. And so this is what is being done by the CubeSat. Um, and so I'm trying to focus on control. So the customer provides um, his preference to the mission management and the mission manager implements that. The 
CubeSat kind of controller is the one that actually um, configures the, the CubeSat. And there are reports that are generated and this is flows up the chain to the mission manager and that, and that can be communicated to the customer. The payload controller actually um, is the one that um, operates the, the payload. And one of the things that takes place is the um, collecting the, the sensor data. And so the mission manager has a higher level type of um, user things. And so it tasks the CubeSat assets and it also receives the, the sensor data. And so um, you can see that if you do these properly, it can open you up to um, a fair amount of dialogue and that is a, a major in, intent of what is intended by a, um, a use case diagram. It's relatively simple, but this is where you can be starting to flesh out the, the requirements. And let me pause to see if um, there's any comments or questions or are you following along with what I'm saying in that regard. So um, what do you think you, you would want to be capturing in terms of a use case for your, your system? Maybe I'll start with um, Nathaniel with your, your missile silos. Um, what do you think would be a, 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 a use scenario that would be taking place with those, those uh, missile silos? Well, yeah, first I had a question on like who I would put for the actors. Would I follow the chain of command for the Air Force since it's supposed to be sold to them and then they operate it? Yeah, so this is this is giving it's from an operational perspective. Mm -hmm. So you could have a stakeholder, you could even say the the DOD, or if you know the, the name of the more specifically, the organization, that's fine. And for simplicity, you could start out by just having a quote, single stakeholder that's likely gonna be um, a cadre of individuals, but you could be starting out with, with that, okay? And you can see how I transition from a customer then to the people that are quote, in the same company, um, just assuming that all of us that are associated with APU, we could say that we're all the same company you might have subcontractors and maybe you could annotate that in, in some way as well. Okay. So does that help with that? Yeah. I think so, yeah. So I have like a stakeholder, the people who operate it and then maybe any contractors who'd work on it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. On Tuesday, I showed you an example of a surveillance system. And so the, um, the operator statuses, the surveillance system is trying to, then you had like an adversary, you had that they could be having some kind of connection with um, the, um, the surveillance system. So this is where you have the noun and here you have the verb. So the controller configures the CubeSat, the payload controller configures the, um, the sensor, um, stuff, stuff like that. And I was trying to give some um, insight into what it might be like for multiple layers. So I would at least try to, um, start out simple, having um, one actor, one system, and one use case that you put and type that system and try and connect those things. So if you haven't done that yet, it's um, worthwhile getting familiar with how you, you do that. So let's just um, take a few minutes to make sure everybody is able to successfully do that. Um, maybe what I'll do is I'll create a new use case diagram. So I'd recommend that you do a blank one. So, Well, the visual paradigm doesn't always have those first two or three letters for the diagram type. I typically put it in. This is an example of one of those that doesn't. So um, let me see if I can um,
pick something. Maybe I'll just try. Um, CubeSat communication. Maybe I'll just pick that a little bit arbitrarily. And so one of the things that you have available to you I've been doing this long enough that trying to find these stick man and, and reuse them. So I, I tried to clean this up. Um, and so, um, well, I'm just gonna use these here. So just these are, are different individuals um, related to, to other diagrams, but just to, um, so this is gonna be for, so I'm trying to, to reuse um, actors that I've already had in another other diagrams. So here I have the the customer. Here I have the the um, bus controller, and so um, not sure where. Well, I'm just going to start from scratch. So, so I'll call this a I'll just call it a communication controller since that's what I'm trying to focus on for the system what is the um, Let's call it the CubeSat system. That in yellow. I'm not sure if I could put a, a system in tight a system. I'm not sure. Okay. No, I can't. Okay. And then I'll have a, a use case. I'll put it something like that, um, communicate to the satellite. So we're uplinking. Um, and so this is going to connect with that. And then I'll create another one. Use a, a different term too. This is called the uplink. This would be So So those are the two um, things that this person is going to be focusing on. And so this could be um, these are meant to be simple, these diagrams, because you're just trying to um, capture the the functionality of what, what is meant to be done. Okay. So um, let me see with um, Jonathan, with your, 
nuclear um, power plant, what do you think would be an example of a um, individuals and what they're going to actually do with that power plant? Um, so like for the person like operating it, I guess they would be receiving information for like how much power is being produced, how much is needed, and they can make adjustments as necessary to the reaction process. Yeah. And you can actually even write that down because that actually this is what we're doing here is going to lend itself for formulating requirements is which is the next step that we're going to be doing. Mm -hmm. And so, um, figure out how much they're generating, how much they're um, how much is being used by their consumers, that would be fine. I can think of, I'm not an expert on um, nuclear power plants, but seeing various movies and other exposures is like you have to monitor the, um, the, the temperature of the cooling pond that tries to, when uh, you put the, um, the radioactive rods that, um, I've forgotten if it's like if it's um uh, a turbine and so it's um it's just basically um heated water that turns a turbine or some other mechanism that's used for that so um think at say at least three things that you want to be capturing in terms of functionality that you want to be laying out and coming up with a, a use case and so maybe turning it on operation and um, the the um, some other type of um, maybe what you would do in a um, um, when an anomaly takes place. So th does that help, Jonathan? Yeah, that helps. Thank you. Okay. And um, for Abby, with your designing and operating your your um, electric car, what do you think you would want to be trying to capture that? Because there's a lot of different points of view that you could be doing that. And so maybe before I just immediately just suggest something, why don't you give me your two cents? Would it be things like like programming the the cameras and like designing the actual model? Yeah, you could do it for production or production point of view. That would be one of the things. You could also do it for operation. And so a driver in the car um, and what they would have access to, or um, if there, we also had talked about the autonomous operation. So in, a, in, a, um, in autonomous operation, it could be, it would be a system operating a system. And so instead of having um, what I'm showing here with a stick man, um, you would have a system operating a system. And so this would be, this one doesn't fit with my you actually diagram, do the production side. but I'll just kind of do this temporarily. And so then this could be going to, no, that's not right. So I could just, you can have this like, probably just easier just to use the stick figure out. I think that might've been Jonathan. I didn't mean to um, talk over you. Um, is there something you were trying to convey that I missed? Or... No. Okay, sorry. Um, um, Trying to rename this one. So would I have two different, like two different um diagrams, one with a system and one with a driver? It is totally up to you. Um try this one more time. Okay, so I have auto drive instead of like a person, maybe you have like um, the 
the um, manufacturing process, then you can have the operation process with a driver, and then an operation process with an auto drive mode. Maybe you might want to be starting out with, with that. And so um, there, there is a fair amount of fle flexibility that we're getting exposed here to. And so you were mentioning maybe the idea of having multiple systems. So I don't know what you think you would want to be having in terms of those systems. You could have like an auto drive system. You could have a, um, um, a normal drive system if you wanted to separate it that way. Um, you can have a, uh, a system for the, the sensor complex, but these are really meant to be simple because there's going to be other diagrams that we're going to be getting into more of those details. So this is meant to have a fairly high level abstraction. So you might want to be thinking about it from, from that point of view. Does that, does that help, Abby? Yeah, thank you. Okay. And Kyle, I don't have any comments or questions. You, you want me to help you to come up with a an idea of what you would be um, using for a use case diagram? Um, I suppose I, so basically what I think is I wouldn't have like a direct user for this. I would have like a per, it would have to like all run automatically. So I'd, need it to like be able to detect whether it's in the sun or not and uh, then I need to figure out which state it's in based on that mm -hmm. like how each state acts yeah and so um you you could still have an actor that um some of this could be automated um or but you could also have like um you go back to my other diagram. So you have a CubeSat controller. Um, say it's going, it's in full illumination from the sun. Okay, then it's into charging the batteries mode. Um, then it goes into an eclipse and then it has to be using the resources from the battery. And um, that would be something that you would be thinking about. But but also, I think what you're going to want to do, Kyle, is you're probably going to have to expand the scope of what you're thinking so that so, some of the, I don't think um, you're going to have to capture like, well, what would be using that battery resources um, from the, the power system, but we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later. So just think if you can come up with three fairly basic um, use cases, um, something maybe of this complexity, and just make sure that you include a description of what it is. This came up a little bit with um, with Jonathan when he was starting to give a soundtrack of what it was going to use. You want to write that down because that's going to be the source of what you're going to be using for requirements. Okay, sounds good. Oh, Abby was saying, is this where we um, need the 10 requirements? This is where you're going to be deriving the requirements. This is one of the things that, that will be helpful for, for that. Okay. All right. Well, let me go over to this other tool that I've been sharing with you, and I'll be, be bringing this up. And so this is this magic system of system architect. There's multiple modalities in which um, this tool can operate. And so um, I'm going to show a few of the use case diagrams that are included with this, um, this one that I've mentioned. So this is this, um, this um, model that's available on the internet, um, if, if, as long as you have a tool that can read it, and then you can um, get this. So I'm going to be walking through this as another contribution for us to figure out um, what we're going to be doing with our, with our system. So <clears throat> um, we don't have the book, but um, they're referring to another textbook that lays out some of an operation. So I was just trying to give a context and Frightenfall in our textbook also does this. Um, we talked on Tuesday about a surveillance system. And so here we can be seen for a space mission that is trying to help out the forest service 
to detect fires in the US and Canada. And so the Forest Service, it wants to detect and monitor for fires. And it gives us a locale in the US and Canada. So then we have the, the stakeholders or the operators. And um, Jonathan was mentioning, um, and I, I think it was um, Nathaniel as well, is to say you have a customer. Um, the maybe if it's going to be them rather than a company that's operating it, you could maybe annotate it with stakeholders. And so they um, they actually uh, the 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 stakeholder the I'll just call it the operator provides forest service fire data in near real time, and so the fire department also um, is using this. And so there's a, a mechanism to how that's made possible, which is not laid out in a use case diagram. They also archiving the data so they can do data trends um, going, say in fire season where fires typically show, show up. And they also monitor and maintain the health and safety of the fire set too. So it's, here we have an indication of the naming of, of, of the system. So that's one um, example here is just, um, so this is, they're calling these mission use cases and so we're, we're not looking at the textbook. So some of this may be a little bit arbitrary. This is actually a little bit higher level. So maybe I should have just showed you this. And so um, we have this, and then we could start to get into some more details in terms of functionality, uh, comparing those two views. And this is a, a different type of use of the um, use di um, diagram. And so this is for the, the mission, so perform mission, and so the various things that has to be doing, you have to launch a spacecraft, separate it from the launch vehicle, deploy the mechanisms, control the trajectory, maintain operations, provide observation data, and mitigate failures. And so this is where I, I told you about this dependency. Um, you can also, these are labeled with includes, these are, this is labeled with an extend. And so that's just a, another example of um, where where we can see things being laid out in terms of capturing um, functionality in a use case diagram. Any questions on that? Do we need to use include or extend? I'm sorry, can, do you need to include users? Uh, do we need to use include or extend uh, for our diagram? No, no. The, the, um, I'm trying to make this not be too complicated here. And so just you can be showing a simple kind of a relationship. And so here it's just an association. You do have dependency and generalization if you want to be using it. Um, this this canvas over on the, the left is helpful. You, there's other ways that you can be pulling up those things as well, but maybe just start for now just with an association. I was trying to allude to a little bit more um, than, than just that, but that, that's something that you, you, you can do, okay? All right, I'm gonna give a little bit of an introduction, but this is something that we'll be talking more about. So this is not the final, but um, this is what you can be doing in um, visual paradigms in terms of a requirements diagram. And so maybe something like this is what you can be capturing if you wanted to colorize things to try and indicate um, subclasses of types of requirements, you're, you're welcome to, to do that. Um, and so um, I, this is just, kind of a, a brush for a lot of things. And so this is the what I'm calling the, the mission. So APU SAT-1 shall perform a communication mission augmented by limited payload imaging collection. So that's what I'm claiming. And so for a requirement, it has to have the word shall. And so the, the noun, shall, and then a verb, and then you describe what it's supposed to do. You don't want to have and in a requirement. If there's an and, then it's two requirements and you want to separate into requirements. 
what happens in visual paradigms, it actually gives a what's called a rec ID number. And it doesn't populate anything else. There's just, um, you can do this by hand. And so here was an example. This was a document, um, NASA CubeSats 101, where I was trying to, to describe a little bit more information. Well, what about, um, you could have some things that are in compliance. And so if we want to have NASA to um, launch our satellite, there are things and standards that we're going to have to deal with. So I just created a requirement that's going to be something that it's gonna to have to deal with that. Um, I pointed out the, the communication. So I was trying to show a communication um, use case diagram. And so here is like the information that would be related to that, um, just in a, in a high level sense of capturing that into one of the requirements that's subservient to this APU SAT mission. Um, here I put in that it's going to be in the LEO orbit, and so it's a low Earth orbit is what that means. Um, if that doesn't mean anything to you, that that's okay. Um, like Elon Musk, is, um, his Starlink satellites are going into LEO orbit. Um, GPS is in something called MEO, medium Earth orbit. And if you have a satellite um, for communication, um, um, the vast majority are something called in geo, and it's called geosynchronous Earth, Earth orbit, and so that's a little bit higher. So I was trying to say that it's going to have 24-hour operation. Um, thinking a little bit in terms of where Kyle is coming from, what he wanted to have a focus on. So um, the payload power support. And so I just, um, off the top of my head, say that the, the payload can... Um, it can use less than or equal to 50% of the available power. And then mission life, I said, it's going to be operating for one year. Um, and then I have a couple other ones that giving a, a value for how much power it would generate. Five watts actually for a one U cube set is pretty sporty, but anyway. And then there's also things like this you can do. This is um, to be determined TBD. So here I, I'm talking about attitude control and I don't know exactly what it's going to, to be. So I just put a requirement, but it's something that needs to be defined and it's not totally laid out here. With this version that you have with the community edition, this is all that can be done, but um, I can show you one other um, thing that you can do, but you get this little warning, editing is supported only by visual paradigm standard. You'd have to pay for that but it does list these different requirements and it also gives the, the rec ID numbers that are associated with that. But that, that's all that we're going to be focusing on for, for that. And we'll be coming back to that um, in following weeks, but I, um, since we're, we're gonna be getting pretty close to um, creating and submitting your use case diagrams, I wanted to at least do a little bit of a heads up for the requirements. So in this other tool, this magic system of systems architect, you can have things in a table. We had that in visual paradigms, but with the version we have, we don't really have that spelled out in any more detail. And so you can have a table view or a tree view. And so this is what we're creating is this tree view. And so these are the, the same information just put in in two different formats. Okay, so I uh, just wanted to give you a little bit of a heads up for, for that. Um, and I'll be jumping back and forth between these tools, hopefully to, to help us out, give us some, some better insight. So think about, about three use case diagrams that you can um, you can conceive. And so when you actually are going to be submitting this, um, make sure that you have a figure that you download and the way you can be doing that, you can do an export, export as image. So you do a right click, you get this um, list of things to do and export, you can export as image and you can make it whatever you would like, a JPEG, um, a PNG, um, those are probably the ones that I, when you submit into Canvas, make sure you, you um, 
include that for your submittal. You also want to have a description of what things are are doing, and so make sure that you include that that information. And so um, you can submit more than once, but let's just go ahead and look at um, that for for the the submittal. Um, so you want to know. Um, Upload an image of your diagrams, include a separate summary of your diagrams. This will be useful for your final report and presentation. I've mentioned this. This is just a reminder of what a use case is. There is a rubric that are associated with each one of these things, each one of these elements. And so you may want to look over that for, for any guidance to, to give you an idea um, what, what's being expected for, for those submittals. Okay, any comments or questions on anything that I've shared today? Anything else? How many use case diagrams do we need? Three or I one? Would, I would recommend that you do three. Okay, so what should the difference between the three be? Well, like I said, um, when you have complex systems, they do all kinds of things. And so you're trying to do only one thing in a use case diagram. And so for the missile silos, you could say um, you want to be doing um, a, say a, a checkout mode, say once a day or once a week, they have to do a, a checkout of the, the missile silo to see if it's functioning properly. That could be an example of a, um, a use case diagram. Um, a second one could be, what would be the the operation? Okay, it's 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 tall. It's it receives the order to launch, and so do they need to have a two key uh, author, authorization to push the go button? They need to be getting there's a there's some various kinds of um, checks that need to be done. To, to verify all that is, is taking place. And say a third one could be, what would you do in an anomalous situation? That could be something that you could think about. So that's a little bit more focused for what you're thinking about, Nathan, but hopefully that gives you some ideas. Oh yeah, that helps. Does so anyone that, else need me to walk you through that? Uh, is it three different use cases on one diagram or like three? No, make it different? three different diagrams. Okay. Yeah, because um, those could be, say, if you were talking with your stakeholders, those could actually be three different conversations. And it's intentionally meant to be simple. And so you're, you're just trying to get that, that stakeholder to, to talk to you and tell you exactly what they want in more detail. And so this diagram can be um, helpful for that. Okay. All right, well, um, please reach out to me if you do have any questions. This can be a lot of fun. It also can be mentally challenging. And so this is the, the simplest diagram that we're going to be doing. But as I mentioned, this, this perspective for system engineering, I remember this, um, this director, when I was first being hired into the first system engineering company that I worked for, it says, instead of um, working harder, you have to think harder. And so you're trying to conceive and create a system um, with a pretty much a blank slate. And so those are those are some things that we're we're trying to do. And hopefully together we can have some 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 interesting things that will come out of that. And I, I look forward to helping each one of you. Okay. All right. Well, God bless everybody. Have a good rest of your day. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.